When this small insect-like helicopter first appeared in the Antipodean skies, it was greeted with considerable scepticism. This machine came down from Hamilton and um, we watched it come down the side of the hangar and there's a gentleman by the name of Bernie Mulroy was with us. And he saw it coming, he raced inside and grabbed a can of fly spray and raced out and uh, sprayed it, which uh, sort of fitted the occasion rather adaptly, I thought. Alpo flying instructor Bruce Harvey was the first New Zealand pilot to put the R-22 to work on live deer recovery, much to the disbelief of his fellow pilots. My first thought to Robbie was not um, very encouraging to be honest, it, it looked a bit flimsy and light, and, uh, which it was, um, and I thought no, not too keen on this, so I said they'll have to make a few, few hundred before I sort of uh, step foot on one. I wasn't that impressed to be honest. But things have changed. Robinsons have had their fair share of accidents, mainly because there's a lot more of them, so they're going to have a high percentage. But um, 95, 98 percent of accidents are pilot error, um, and the Robinson in the early days didn't have a, a good, good name because um, people took them too lightly. You know, they're a machine to be respected, and it was high time fixed wing guys who were causing most of the accidents in the Robbies. And Frank Robinson had courses to um, remedy this problem by having safety seminars and things like that. And the accident rate has come down dramatically. But again, it's, I, I maintain 98% of accidents are pilot error. Yeah. Yeah, I went to America in the, in the early 80s um, to do a safety course over there. And um, um, there were only three Robinsons in the country at that stage. I had the third one. And um, we, being typical Kiwis, were the first guys to make them work. Um, first to spray with them, first to have a cargo hook on. Frank was absolutely astonished to um, hear we had cargo hooks on the Robinsons. And um, I showed him some photographs of the design which was done in Christchurch, which he reluctantly agreed with and said, yeah, well, it was, he, he wouldn't put it on himself, but it was okay. He sort of gave it the quiet nod and said, we, you know, we'd put the hook in the right place. Well, when I first decided to use a Robbie on venison, I thought, well, it's got to lift 100 kilos safely and efficiently. And um, I went down the South Island to a chap by the name of Stephen Field who had one. We got some number eight wire out, rolls number eight wire, weighed them up, stropped them up 100 kilos, and uh, did some tests with it. And um, I was certainly impressed. I thought, well, now this will do the job. But what I want to do was lift one hind, $2,000 note. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. They were certainly looking at me sideways. They, I was the first one to have a go at it, and they were waiting for me to crash, as, as, as they would do. And um, it didn't sort of eventuate. Then I started getting quite a few phone calls, you know. How was the Robbie going on the venison? And I said, no, it's not that flashed. It's no, it's no good at all. Don't, don't, don't try it. You'd be sorry. And um, quietly, I was just nibbling away, and it was going very well. But they got onto it later on, and uh, I was sprung. there by myself. I had uh, two belly guns mounted underneath, initially one, but then um, I decided two was better, gave me more scope, and then progressed along uh, with a little guy down the valley who was dead keen to have a crack as a shooter, 
And uh, with a robber, you can have one fat guy, one skinny guy. The fat guy can be the pilot, and the skinny guy is on the other side. You can't have two fat people. One fat, one skinny, it works well. Preferably a skinny shooter for the CFG thing, getting in and out of the machine. Yeah. Team thing in a, in a Robbie and venison is vitally important because you can do a run for an hour without speaking, um, which is normally why it's hand signals and you understand each other and there is no talking. Only when there's a horrific stuff up, <laughs> there is a bit of talking then. It's normally blue, but um, no, it's just understanding the other guy and uh, it works well if you get the good guy. It takes about $20,000 in the old days to train a shooter with all the misses and hard luck stories that you get. But um, a good shooter was worth his weight in gold. And they used to get paid well as well. It's really unstable, the Robbie. What we used to do was have a rope knotted every foot and um, we'd have it permanently on the cargo hook and it would fold into the door here, wrap round. And so um, when the shooter wanted to get out and it was too far to jump, he'd just throw the rope out and slide down the rope. And it was long enough so it didn't go into the tire rotor. And that worked well. This particular machine here I bought brand new in 1996. Now I said that there's a few things lacking with the Robbie. One was horsepower, two was a seating arrangement, a little bit narrow for two guys. Uh, but with this one it's got the Beta 2, bigger engine, 180 horse. Put the new doors on, which um, Tech will make, um, it widens the bubble by seven and a half inches. The seats also we've modified, um, a bit wider here. We've put an extra panel on the side here and um, it's, it's come up well. You're just looking at the, uh, the flange bolts as they come round and just mixing them all together, it's good. Robbie is a training machine, I think it's uh, one of the better. Obviously I'm a little bit biased, but having owned a 300 and a Robinson, um, a Robbie, if you can fly it correctly, um, you, the, the rest is easy. Uh, a little bit more involved to, to get the hang of them, a lively little helicopter, but once you've got the hang of the lobby, uh, the rest is easy. To fly 300 in 10 hours, this one 20. Um, 300 is a lot more forgiving, and you could get away with teaching a guy in hobnail boots and boxing gloves. Uh, you'd have to take the gloves off and take the boots off in a lobby. A lot more finesse. At Wanaka in the South Island, veteran flying instructor Simon Spencer Bauer soon realised the huge potential of this remarkable helicopter. First started flying in Entrams and then we had uh, Hughes 300s for quite a while. And once we started getting the Robinsons in the, in the mid 80s, the whole reliability you know, just changed completely. And it made, it made uh, flight training so much safer because you could rely you know, on the machines coming home and, and on, on the guys coming home and people not having any dramas or anything like that. Made so much difference. It's revolutionised the helicopter industry basically. The philosophy from Robinson is that it's a, a cheap, relatively cheap, affordable helicopter for, for the masses. Unfortunately it inherits all the low ad pilots because <laughs> it's uh, Everyone who learns to fly in it, and it's the first helicopter they can afford, so therefore, um, you know, I guess, you know, a lot of the, uh, the low air pilot accidents are attributed to the Robinson, because, you know, it's the, one of the, it is the most prolific helicopter in the world. And being produced, the Robinson 22 and the 44 uh, are produced in greater numbers than any other type in the world today. Incredible. Mm. Just a wonderful little helicopter. I personally have sat in the Robinson 22 myself for 10,500 hours and it's never let me down. And uh, my company has operated them for in excess of 40,000 hours and we have never had a engineering failure on the machine or the machine has never let us down in all those times. And here, anyway, um, hook training is actually a compulsory part of a commercial license, and it, it is associated with the type of operations that we do in this country. Uh, we're a mountainous country; we have, uh, you know, a lot of mountain training that we have to do, and that is another compulsory part of our commercial licenses and private licenses. 
was a training helicopter, I believe they produce a far better pilot than, than just about any other type. Now the Robinson is not, it's not the easiest of helicopters to fly. It's, you know, being a two-bladed system, it's uh, probably what we call an unstable, you know, in terms of the instability of helicopters, it is more unstable uh, than a multi-bladed helicopter. But that in itself is a plus because you can hop out of a Robinson and you can go and you know, hop into a Bell to a six to a squirrel and with minimal training you can go away and fly it. Whereas in the old days when we used to fly in multi-bladed helicopters which are far more stable and probably easier to learn to fly in but you couldn't convert to you know, the other types quite as easily. So in the long run the Robinson really does produce a better pilot in my opinion. Yes, well, Frank originally designed this in the early 70s. I think the prototype flew as a two-seater commuter. That's what it was designed for, to take two guys and a lunchbox from A to B. Uh, but when they came to New Zealand, if it couldn't lift a ton or have a cargo hooker put on it or spray, no one wanted to know about it. So the Kiwis, you know, put them to work. And uh, they're still doing it to this day. Kept within its limitations, the R-22 is a very, very useful helicopter for spraying. But once again, if you start loading it up, it's like anything. People load it up to try and make the extra money or whatever they're trying to do, and that's when it all comes unstuck. So if you keep within the limitations, they're certainly um, very, very, very good.
Doug Maxwell is a highly regarded pilot who began his flying career in 1972 and was involved in pioneering early deer capture with the innovative Tim Wallace. Plummeting prices of live deer in 1982, Doug was forced to make the transition to the R22. Minaret Station on the shores of Lake Wanaka have called on Doug Maxwell's expertise to help with the August deer muster. Today we're going to be mustering what we call the Pikes Block, which is essentially a thousand hectares that ranges from um, a thousand feet here at the lake. Uh, through to about 4,700 feet. We can be hiring R22 for close to a third of what we can be hiring a small turbine helicopter for. And we've found that given a, a good operator, they're the perfect machine for the job. If we've got the helicopter in the air, we usually have two to three men on the ground with dogs. So the deer are looking up as well as looking down. It just gives them more to keep them on their toes, really. stock sense of someone who knows how deer move and we, we tend to move different mobs at a time and then sometimes we'll put a mob and put them into a bit of scrub, we know they'll, they'll hold there for a certain amount of time and then come back and, and get them. So we're not essentially moving the whole face at once, we're doing it in stages. takes between four to six hours. Hopefully we've got the wind right today, um, so we should be looking at close to the four hours. It can go the other way, the minaret block for instance, it takes six hours to muster, well this year it took us 12 hours, we had to do it twice. The wind plays a huge part, and we usually find that the first 10 to 15 minutes, those are the siding minutes, and if it's not working, Doug flies home. Obviously if you couldn't muster with a helicopter then you, you wouldn't be farming deer on a set stock basis on this sort of country. So what's the purpose of getting the deer into that? It's August, it's close to the end of the winter, we're weaning these animals. So there's um, 800 hinds on here and usually we wean around the 95% mark. Um, so we should be uh, close to 700, 754 and coming out of here today. The R22 is a great little machine. Put one person in it and there's quite a lot of uh, excess power available and they're quite a high performing little helicopter. Put two people in them and get a bit of altitude in it 
and you've got a handful and that's the biggest thing you've got to get to really know your machine the ability what it can do and what it can't do on a fine winter morning Doug and his shooter Robert Andrews are airborne early to begin a rabbit control operation on Central Otago's Tinburn station since their release in the 1860s Rabbits have continued to cause significant environmental problems. Like many Central Otago farmers, station owner Tussock Lucas spends a significant part of his income controlling rabbits. We've got 10,500 acres, and uh, yeah, it's all pretty, uh, pretty rabbit prone country, or well, three quarters of it is. Well, the choppers are for follow up. We, uh, it's quite essential um, what we poisoned last year out here. Uh, it's about probably about 1,500 acres. We, uh, he, uh, the chopper's just been over that now and shot, um, he tells me, 50 rabbits. That's, he got 30 after the poison last year, so it's just a matter of mopping up. And yeah, a lot of them are pears too, which is uh, yeah, good um, to get yeah, just before the breeding season. Well, we find it's really good to get a good operator and he um, knows the country and good shooter and uh, yeah, he can get into the gullies and seems to be able to yeah, get, get on them pretty well. So the RCD, is it sort of just faded right out? It's just not working well enough for us to, um, to rely on it completely. When the rabbits disappeared, you couldn't believe it, right? Oh yes, that's um, that's what we're, that's why we've had to get back into poisoning again. We uh, found that there were just too many rabbits out. The country's too bare. Uh, rather than putting on fertilizer now, we've uh, the last two years we've been uh, poisoning rabbits. You know, just putting that money into poisoning. It's about um, you know it's been working out probably uh, a quarter of our wool clip. Um, you know we've been spending uh, the last two years on uh, on. Uh, poisoning rabbits so uh, it's quite a bit and we you know it's providing we sell the wool that's what it'll work out providing we do sell the wool this year depending how much price aren't good at the moment for wool either so. come in as the final in the sense that all the easy ones are shot we're only getting the hard ones and it's like on this property we're here now um, the farm has just poisoned a large block which has been very very expensive and had a very good kill and we've come in afterwards and are shooting what we can find which is which is the residue if we can half or even quarter the numbers that are left, that could extend the life of that poison by, it could double it. But this sort of country around here, there's lots of country that's got either too, too th thick and scrubby or too steep where you can't get a vehicle. And that's where we come in and some of the areas that we uh, actually hunt have never been hunted before as far as secondary control, they've been poisoned but they've never had any follow-up work done and that's where we can come in and do some follow-up work. We've got to have low numbers to make it viable. You've got to be able to cover a lot of country and not have high numbers. So that if we shoot more, more than say 100 an hour, what's happening is that we're, we're not getting as high a percentage as if we were only shooting say 30 or 40 an hour. Um, but the rabbits tend to run around you because there's so many you, you just can't shoot quick enough. And at times, in different situations we've been, we've been up to 250 an hour. We're killing rabbits, but we're not doing a good job.
cover it with motor bikes night shooting, um, that's probably actually more efficient. But at the end of the day, you can still use the helicopter to get the ones you're not getting by any, any other methods. And the scrubby stuff, you know, especially like this time of year in the winter time, the leaves are off the briar, you can see down into it and you can shoot right through it. And even if you just catch a glimpse of the rabbit running through, you can still black them through the bloody scrub. Um, it's quite surprising how thick you can shoot them through the scrub and it's very effective because you're looking down and you can see what's there. And um, you get a good overview of the whole block when you're working and you'll find any wee patches that are left behind and you can have a good clean out. Ahaura on the west coast of the South Island is the base for R22 pilot Simon Lawn. Today Sutton's Moss Company has contracted Simon to lift bags of moss from a remote Westland swamp. Once lifted from the swamp to a waiting truck, the moss is transported to the factory where it's dried and exported to Japan. Today, Simon's joined by his shooter, Phil Cole, to recover venison from the surrounding mountains. Simon's a shareholder in a wild game processing company. He's being contracted to fill an order for the Blenheim factory. Whilst in the past, larger turbine helicopters were used for venison recovery, lower prices have made these machines uneconomic. The R-22's low operating cost enabled Simon to carry out his operation profitably.
a lot of ridicule over these machines, especially the 500 guys. But they're as safe as the pilot, and they've had good pilots to fly with. So that's probably the main thing. You definitely wouldn't want to go out in the hill with guys that hadn't done many hours. Part of the requirements now, we've got to write down that record the GPS coordinates for the deer we've shot. Once you're getting out in a certain situation, you've definitely got to go no matter what. So that hinges on the pilot not getting, not checking it out, and trying to pull away. When he's got hadn't got enough power, he's better off to just go in and let you out, and then he loses 80k. Then that makes all the difference. Really, they they can do anything any other helicopter can do. Extracting pink pine logs from the windrows of old cutover forest is another unusual task for Simon and his R22. Well, it goes down to Needham to a company called West Kim and other people we work for, contract to. And uh, they, they've got a little niche market for perfume over in Europe. And uh, they extract them all out of the wood and put them in the rule. Way better for us to use, Robbie. And with our lift, the lift that we make of our strops, um, a lot of the wood's quite small and we've got to you know, make little lifts and it's hard enough making lifts for the Robbie. Um, you know, 180 kilos, whatever we're making, and to make efficient lifts for the uh, 500, that just wouldn't, wouldn't happen. It's clean, it's a clean operation for chopper, and uh, very efficient. And he can do, we can do a lift, and he can get in three hours, he can get us near 20 ton. Not bad for what we're doing. in there as well, we found that that frees up two men because we don't need one hooking and we don't need one unhooking. So we just leave them to it, we can go back to work, do our giant ropes, let them go back in on the grapple and we can go home and we just carry on with something else. And he'll do another hour, hour and a half grapple this on his own. And to be honest, the way he's getting there, he's, he's just as quick as putting rope on the hook. He's getting very good at it. Released into the Mount Cook region in 1904, the Himalayan tar are well suited to the bluffs and ice of the Southern Alps. In this inhospitable terrain, the helicopters become an important management tool in controlling their numbers. Usually the bush line to 7,000 feet is sort of our, our limit for getting in and out. It's a matter of just knowing where the traps are. It's all right, it's on the steep hills you've always got an escape route to, to sort of peel off. When you go up, you come into those high basins and you're down low and you've got nowhere to go, you've really got to watch it when you haven't got a lot of power. They soon let you know because they, you, you, the RPMs, everything, with, I think with all helicopters, but the 22. To keep your revs up at 100, 104%. The whole thing is 
about teamwork. We've been up to 7,800 sheep and tar and picking them up at 7,500 7 and, and as long as you're careful and don't rush things, uh, still be quite productive. Simon Lawn has a market for tar meat and has planned an operation in the Mount Cook region of the South Island. The arrival of winter snows makes the tracking and recovery of these beardless mountain goats an easier task for Simon and his crewman, Phil Cole.
Shooting and recovering these animals at up to 7,000 feet is demanding flying and requires a highly skilled helicopter crew. Part of mountain training is, is all about learning to assess power and appreciate the little differences that can mean the difference between uh, landing at high altitude and not landing at high altitude. With you uh, flying in such a way that you don't have a way out of that and you haven't got a, a contingency plan, well then it's not going to be your day. It's, a, it's the nature of us Antipodeans, you know, we tend to, whether it's a Land Rover or whether it's a helicopter, we tend to work it to its maximum. And uh, I think um, the little Robinson was, has been performing tasks that it was never ever envisaged, you know, it would be used for. coast of the North Island, stock agent Tony Holden has planned a muster of wild cattle that are impacting on native forest and causing problems with the stock of Pakihiroa Station. For this muster, Tony's called on the expertise of helicopter pilots Mark Law and Pete Moore. The idea of the toppers is when I worked in Australia back in 93 in the Kimberleys, and they always told me that when you chase a wild cattle with a chopper, the first time they don't know what the chopper is, they'll go like hell. At the end of the day, if we don't get them in the choppers, I'll go back with the decoys and we'll get them one by one. Might be over a period of time, but we'll get them. Now with these cattle, this is what he's going to do with the top part, bring out onto the seats here. And we're going to do these switches over here. Okay. I'll, just, uh, I'll just talk to Mark, eh? Hey, you're right there, mate. The altitude rough is about two and a half thousand feet here in the North Island. It's quite warm. It's sitting between probably 20, 30 knots, maybe gusting 35 knots. Uh, makes it a quite tricky flying, mainly because you can't get in and boss the, uh, the cattle around as much as you like. You're always turning into wind.
top is where the, um, where the absolute beginning and end of the whole thing, you know, we wouldn't have done it without the choppers. in Australia it was all flat and dry here well, with the wind and the hills and the rain today well I was quite happy to get out of it really. Six hundred and eighty kilometres south of Darwin, Victoria River Downs Station is the base of a unique helicopter operation serving the Territory's cattle industry. Helimuster is one of Australia's first helicopter cattle mustering companies and is now managed by veteran mustering pilot Mark Robbins. We're, we're basically an, an independent uh, helicopter company. This is our main base on VRD. Uh, and we do, you know, all the, the parent company's mustering uh, and, you know, most of their normal aviation requirements. But we also contract out to any, anyone else uh, that, you know, needs cattle mustered. We'd have 12 machines, 13 machines, depending on uh, just the maintenance requirements at the time. Yeah, you know, that allows us two or three spare machines at any given time, so if, if there is a problem, on the job, we can replace it a lot quicker than uh, would normally be expected. Basically, the fuel consumption. Yeah, that, that was initially what sold the, the R22 to the to the clients, uh, and then over the years, you know, the, the technology uh, difference in the 47 to the to the 22. Yeah, we didn't sort of take to it too readily, I suppose, to start with, uh, because you know, the 47s were like flying lounge chairs, I suppose, compared to these things to start with. Get used to anything, eh? The size and scale of the properties here is amazing. What would be the biggest paddock you've ever mustered? 2,600 square K. You wanted big, didn't you? <laughs> and that, that'll be a few days' work, though, wouldn't it? Would yeah, no, yeah, that'd be two or three days for multiple helicopters going to different points. It's not a, a stepping stone to real flying, it, it sort of is the real flying I suppose if you like. Um, yeah, it's, if, if people have the idea that they, they'll just use it for quick hours and they'll turn up here, get in a helicopter, go out and, and chase some cows around, um, yeah, they're sadly mistaken, it's just not going to happen. Yeah, the, these days you, you you can't afford to have someone flying the machine and supposedly doing the job unless you can guarantee at the end of it that they do the job properly. It's up to the individual for a big part of it as to whether they come out the other end or not. I did seven or eight years working as a ringer on the ground in stock camps and the station I was working on had their own helicopter. So I went away and did my licence over the wet season and came back to the station to start work for the season and Heli must have been for a full-time commercial pilot and I decided it was more money and a bit more fun. It just takes a while till I get to know you because it has been a male industry for a long time. But yeah, you just got to get out there and start proving yourself and prove you're out there in the, you know, for the long haul and not just in it for the glamour and the glory, which there isn't much of actually. But <laughs> They're huge. 
I did one paddock the other day that was 700 square kilometres, which is the size of my parents' place back in Queensland, and that was one paddock. Yeah, it took a bit to get over. That grey calf in line with them three cows, or a bit behind it? It started off way before my time in the helicopter, but it's, it's come the full circle of being used gently to being thinking it was the only answer to do the whole deal to coming back now to being just a it's what I said to Mark the other day, just a, another management tool you, know, you use, as well as every other thing you've got available to get the job done cost effectively and efficiently. It's, it's a profession, it's just like a carpenter, he knows how to drive a nail in. Mm. We're professional mustering pilots, we know how to muster cattle. You know? it's, it's, <clears throat> it's a trade or a profession on its own, oh yeah, definitely. It's one of the few trades in the world where you want to go and learn, you have to pay someone to teach you, whereas you go and learn many other trades, they pay you to learn. Yeah, she come over here a couple of times last year and done, must have one paddock for me, but yeah, I gave her a bit of a hard time, poor bugger. She done a really good job, but I didn't, I didn't tell her that. <laughs> she hasn't been back. <laughs> The mustering industry itself has become a lot more professional over the years. Yeah, it's a lot more of a uh, career rather than just a getting a few hours or marking time until you move on to something else. You need to have a fair few skills on the ground before you can sort of attempt to get into there. You know, it's 12 or 18 months at the hangar here before you're flying on your own mustering. Five, 28, even 30 degree top, but the humidity's not there and it's, it's not too bad. But once you get into the 35, high 30s in summertime, the high humidity, it really does eat into the performance of the machine. Helicopters getting around like a bush cockroach and doing all this flash bloody fancy work and that. I tell you, you work for them cattle then, but if they bring them in all walking in steady and that, they just, you can just pick them up and away you go. As soon as they're stirred up, mate, they're stirred up and you have trouble. You've got to treat them like women. You do the right thing by them and let them think they're getting a win, you're right. As soon as they think you're putting it over them, you've got no chance. <laughs> <laughs> it certainly is. Yeah, no, it's totally different. You sort of get two seasons here. There's a wet season and a dry season. And um, the dry, se dry season is actually winter time. It's cooler. There's normally no cloud apart from today. And uh, the wet season is sort of like rain, pretty wet, and it's really hot and humid, pretty unbearable. And um, due to the situation of the rain, and you can't use trucks, no one sort of musters. So all the mustering's done in the dry season. But you've definitely got to know, you know, a fair bit about stock on the ground and how to muster on the ground and that sort of thing. You know, just cattle handling skills, that sort of thing. Because it is different, like in New Zealand, you know, you've got the small paddocks and that, whereas over here, it's a lot of places are just free range. You don't actually have paddocks. 
and the places that do have paddocks are just thousands and thousands of acres. Most of the paddocks are probably, oh, they're probably 20, 30,000 acres. Yeah, so they're nice, they're big paddocks. Sort of like some of them you've got to use three, four helicopters in. Might take you two days to muster the paddocks, so yeah, they're good size. The thing that you would notice from New Zealand is the size of the place, isn't it? The vastness. Oh, it's huge, place. yeah, yeah. Like you fly for five or six hours in one direction and you still know we're near the coast. Yeah, it's a pretty huge place. At Victoria River Downs, Hallimaster's ground crew tackle the endless paperwork as well as ensuring the robbies are maintained to the company's highest standards. Very good work atmosphere, very professional, no pressure to do the wrong thing or anything like that. It's uh, quite easy from my perspective. Good team of people, they come and go a bit because it's, you know, people often only stay out here for a couple of years at a time, that sort of thing. Yeah, fairly extreme uh, environment to operate any helicopter, I suppose, but the R22 has more than proved itself in this environment. Uh, it is very harsh to dust the heat and that sort of thing. I just love the countryside out here. I work as an itinerant worker, so when the work's on, I'm busy. I get to travel around, see the best parts of the country, work on uh, yeah, pretty interesting machines in interesting work conditions. On a good year, probably doing 1,200 hours on each machine. One of these engines goes for 2,200 hours, so yeah, we're doing engine changes on each helicopter. Just over two years. So that's pretty, yeah, pretty significant maintenance happening all the time. The airframes have got a life on them too, 2,200 hours for all the components. So that gives us a fair bit of work to do. Sometimes we do it up here, sometimes you um, send the work elsewhere, but yeah, we have a lot of oil cooling problems. We run the second cooler on most of the machines. Um, we do our magneto inspections a bit uh, more regularly than the, um, the book says. So we pull them off at 300 hours. The book calls up for about 500, so um, we just like to keep on top of those. The lubrication in the felts in the heat sometimes leaks out a lot more. In the R22, because they're D-rated engines, um, not leaving them idling on the ground for so long. So, yeah, um, when they leave them idling on the ground, the oil heats up and actually glazes onto the bore of the cylinder. And that's when their oil consumption starts going up. Just to try to treat the engines actually as hard as you can. Um, they like the hard work. They like getting out there and being flogged. So, none of this sitting on the pad with it idling for 20 minutes. It's, it's when you see the engineers going out and throwing spanners at the pilots. <laughs> 12,000 hours a year is the goal, so between all the machines, it's a lot of flying. You know, we probably probably have one or two breakdowns a, a year where we have to go out and replace some parts in field or something like that. So get pretty good reliability out of the R22. Crocodiles or no crocodiles, even mustering pilots must have some recreation and the chance to catch a fish on the way home is not to be missed. change your mind halfway through but you know to start with you, you've got to accept it as a career if you want to be successful. Yeah it's a good job, there's heaps of flying, yeah no it's just a great job. Now they're a really good mob, a whole lot there that I find anyhow really good mob do, right from people that are just still ferrying machines out to try and get a start to you know 20,000 hour pilots to mechanics you know they're, they're a really good mob. Well, they're just not going to tell me to piss off one of the two. <laughs> the pilots at Hallimuster are among the few privileged to fly over this vast land and to work with those real Australians who call the outback home.
When Frank Robinson designed the R-22, little did he realise that Australasian pilots would put his helicopter to work in a way that far exceeded his original design intentions. From outback Australia to the southern Alps of New Zealand, the Robinson R-22 has proved itself to be an incredibly reliable and safe helicopter and will continue to fulfil a multitude of roles in the skies around the world. Saxton's country. Fly with helicopter pilot Dave Saxton, a legend in South Westland. Meet some real Kiwi characters in Fishermen of the Fjords, the tale of a unique group of fishermen in search of the elusive rock lobster, and experience the adventure of backcountry cattle mustering in Westland Muster. These three great videos are available from Whitcools and Paper Plus stores throughout New Zealand. Get one for yourself or a friend today. The mountains of New Zealand are wild, rugged, and often inhospitable places. In this beautiful but dangerous environment, an elite group of professional hunters fought a 50-year war to reduce exploding animal numbers from destroying the mountain lands. Known as deer colours, they blazed trails across much of New Zealand's unexplored backcountry. To survive the isolation and the demanding environment, they had to be good, keen men.